You're in a good place now. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's episode of Live Your True Life Perspectives, I will be talking about toxic relationships. Yes, I have done many shows on this subject before, but this show will be a little bit different because I think oftentimes when we're in a really, 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 really toxic relationship, it's pretty profound and we know. Okay, we know it, but we might not know a way out. But sometimes we're in toxic relationships, whether it's with a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a spouse, uh, you know, an employee, a boss, a friend, a family member, and we don't really realize it's toxic because we've been around it so long. We've been around it so long that it feels and it seems like normal place. And because we've been around it so long and it seems so normal, it's just it's just the way it's been. And so we just accept it. And oftentimes in those situations, you don't have someone that can let you know and tell you and go, hey, hey, by the way, what's going on in that relationship? It's not healthy. It's actually pretty toxic. And so I'm here to help right now to offer you the ability to see not only the symptoms, but also the signs of being in a toxic relationship. You know, I thought it was very interesting lately, uh, I was trying to figure out, is there a toxic relationship in my life? Do I have a toxic relationship? And I I, I did a lot of inventory. I did a lot of inventory. I did a very large, vast personal inventory on the people I spend time with, on the people that I talk with, all that kind of stuff. And, And I don't have, which is great, any toxic relationships in my life and ones that have been more toxic um, we've worked through, we've we've really had um, deep conversations and, you know, we were adults and we came to the table and we spoke about what we needed to speak about and we spoke our truth. And yes, it didn't all work out in the very beginning, but over time, things have gotten better and it's been very powerful. However, there was one relationship, and I think this will make y'all laugh, I hope, Or if you're in the same boat with me, it might make you cry. I realize that I actually have a toxic relationship with my car, with my vehicle. And it's much like a person, and this might make you laugh as well. So I've had my car for a long time. It only has 50,000 miles on it, and I've had it since it was brand new, okay? And I have literally, I love that car. You know, I I wash it by hand on my own. I clean the interior. I do what I can. And I, I like that. I've always taken a personal responsibility of my car. I've always have. It's just something that was innately within me. And it's interesting because my car is one of those cars that when it runs, it's awesome. When it when it runs, it's an awesome car. Okay. But sometimes I get in the car and I don't ever know what to expect. So baseline, I don't ever know what's going to happen. Okay, I'm not really ever sure what's going to happen. Some days are great. Some days I'll be driving down the road and the AC will shut off and it won't come back on and it's 105 degrees outside. Other times everything's perfect. She looks great. Car looks great. It's all working. And the next thing you know, like seven different like electrical lights go on all at one time. And I feel like I'm driving some sort of 18 wheeler because the suspension went out. As you can see, it's something all the time. And it's interesting how when we are dealing with toxic relationships, right? When we're dealing with toxic relationships, we really don't see that they're toxic because we've dealt with it for so long. So I've had this car for many years. Some people would consider this a long marriage. It's been eight years. It's a good, solid marriage. And, you know, I'm always taking up for it. I'm always bringing it into the shop, trying to get it worked on, trying to take care of it. You know, I went to bat, you know, for some stuff that needed to be done with the dealership. And then I went all the way up the chain of command, you know, to uh, to go through the, the national um, and the international just to try to get some stuff covered, got that done. So a lot of stuff. So, you know, if you were looking at it from like the human perspective instead of the car, you know, there's been a lot of maintenance, a lot of health issues, a lot of problems, but I've been there every step of the way and things just don't seem to get fixed. And it's interesting because I've been offered, I've, I've, I've seen cars, there's been some great sales, but I just can't let this one go. 
Okay, I just can't let this go because when we have it, when it's great and that bond is great and, and everything's working and the car's driving, I'm driving, and everything's great, it's awesome. I mean, it's awesome. We are like, you know, we are mono e mono. Everything's going great. But it's wild how literally within a moment of everything going great, everything can fall apart. The wheels can come off, for God's sakes. And that's when we're talking. We're talking about toxic relationships. What happens oftentimes is, it's so normal that we've been dealing with it for so long that we don't realize that it's toxic. We just deal with it. And, you know, a good example is like me driving down the road and the AC goes out. It's 105 degrees. The AC goes out because there's something wrong with, it says just the battery has been under or overcharged. And that to me looks like more like an electrical issue than anything. And then all of a sudden, all these other things happen. Within five minutes, you know, I have the whole panel lit up. And everything was just fine right before. And then I, I just deal with it. I don't think about it. And it's not until, you know, my husband gets in the car the other day. And I, I, I hadn't thought about it. You know, I hadn't thought about the AC problem. I mean, it goes off like every other day. You know, for a good 20, 30 minutes driving down the street. It'll come back on slowly. You'll get a little bit of air. You usually got to pull over and, and, and turn it back on to get the air. But the air went off. And he literally looked at me and said, what is this? What is going on? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, it looks like the AC came off. And what is it? What's the warning light? And I, and I told him about that. And he's like, how often does this happen? And I said, oh, you know, every other day, maybe. Not a big deal. And he's like, every other day? So every other day you don't have uh, AC in the car and it's 100-something degrees outside? I was like, yeah, but it's no big deal. I mean, it, it comes back on later on, and if it doesn't, you know, you just pull over, and, you know, it's just the way it is. And he's like, so you just gotten used to this. you just gotten used to the fact that you just don't have AC and it's 105 degrees, and you're okay with that. I was like, no, it's not a big deal. Well, it was a big deal, and he has vowed not to ever ride in my car again with me because between that and the other... Uh, warning lights coming on. He he fears for his life, apparently. And and I, I, I get it. I think it's a little bit of a, you know, I think it's like an overkill on this thing. I don't really think that's legitimate. But I actually step back and realize this is very similar to a toxic relationship. We make a lot of excuses. We stay in it even when, well, even when the, the chips seem to be set against us, even when it seems like the house is constantly winning. You know, we, we see, we try to always see the silver lining all the time, no matter what. And, you know, we're constantly telling ourselves this is okay, this is fun, it's not a big deal. You know, other people deal with this, it's not a big deal. There's a lot more issues in the world, there's a lot more stress in the world, it's not a big deal. I can deal with this, I've dealt with worse. And it's not until someone kind of tells you and brings it to light and says, you know what, this isn't normal. What you're dealing with is not normal. This is what normal is, and what you're dealing with is not normal. And it's interesting because when I listen to other people talk about their car, for example, much like a relationship when you think about it, and I was explaining about how, you know, in the lifetime of my car, I think it's been in the shop like 70 times. And they were like, you've got to be kidding me. And I was like, what about yours? They're like, I think it's been in the shop like... Like three times since I had it for like five years. I'm like, you're just lucky. And then I started asking around and I'm realizing, you know what? I don't know what kind of fantasy land I've been living in, but it has been a difficult one. And I've realized that many of us are in these types of relationships right now, whether it's a it's a romantic relationship, a girlfriend, boyfriend situation, a marriage. Um, it could be even a boss employee relationship or even a mother or father relationship that you're dealing with, and we don't even realize that it's quite toxic. And the first thing that I want to talk about, the first symptom, first sign that you're in a toxic relationship is that there's often a lot of passive aggression involved in this relationship. There's a lot of a passive-aggressive attitude about one person. And, you know, it can also, you know, it, it's a two-way street, and sometimes, you know, people can react and battle back with that. But for the most part... One person uses the technique of passive aggression very well. Okay? And I think you know when somebody's using uh, passive aggressive behavior because they're not being straightforward, they're not being honest, um, they're not being truth true with their words and deeds, right? You know, instead of just saying, hey, I'm upset, or hey, I'd really like to talk about this because this, you know, rubbed me the wrong way, Instead of that, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you some side eye glances and, you know, I might slam the door. 
Uh, I might break something, you know, when I'm in the kitchen and I'm having to cook something and I don't want to cook. I might, you know, open the pots and pans drawer, slam it, maybe drop a pan on the ground, you know, something like that as loud as possible. Utensils clicking and clacking, you know, when you're on the phone on some important call. Okay, so passive aggression is a very interesting technique. Uh, To me, it's a very simple, childlike technique. It's almost a technique that would be used by an aggressive five-year-old to get their point across. However, it's used by many people, and oftentimes the people that use passive-aggressive behavior, they learned it from their parents. Okay, they learned it somewhere. You know, it's like when the kids come back from school and they've learned the newest cuss words. They've they've learned it. You, you didn't cuss in front of them, but they've learned all these cuss words. They learned it from someone in school. They learned it, right? It's just like us. We learn things from our family and our upbringing and our environment, and we take it with us until we actually work it out. Stay tuned when I return. I'll be talking more about how to identify your toxic relationship and what you can do once you found it. Live your true life perspectives with me, your host, Ashley Burgess. We'll be back in. I'll be back this time in two shakes. Turn it up and jump in the deep end on perspectives. Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's episode of Perspectives, we're talking toxic relationships, how to identify that toxic relationship in your life, the one that's wreaking havoc in all areas of your life because we can't compartmentalize anything, and what you can do about it once you locate it, okay? Because oftentimes, what? We don't realize it's toxic because we've been around it so long. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's from A to B. You don't realize it's toxic because you've been around it so long. I mean, there you go. You know, it's like it's like when people are like dealing with mold issues and they don't realize they have mold because they've been living with it so long they can't smell it anymore. They don't even realize that the symptoms that they're dealing with is directly from mold exposure. They just think it's something else. We just discredit it. Our mind begins to tell us, it's okay, we're all right, it's no big deal. Okay, and it's the same thing in a toxic relationship. Like I was giving you the example earlier about my car. I do love my car. I love my car, and and I know that sounds weird, but I love I I, I do I I mean it's a, it's a it's a machine, but it's also energy. It's got it, you know produces energy, and to some degree, I believe that the more you care about the machines around you and stuff like that, I I think they work better, and and I think that you connect with them, and. I've always been, I've always cared about my cars ever since my very first car. Um, I've always cared about it. And so this particular car, though, has so many issues. So many issues. And I, I try to overlook it. I try to deal with it. But, you know, quite honestly, it's really tough. I mean, quite honestly, dealing with these issues can be quite, well, quite frustrating. And I know it's not the same as being married to or dating someone and you're in a a toxic relationship, but it is kind of because I'm making a lot of excuses, okay? I don't want to make changes, but yet it's not adding to my quality of life. You know, I can't tell you how many countless times I've had to pull over and get a tow truck and I can't get to where I need to go because, well, something's happened, you know, because this or that or whatever, the transmission's gone out, okay? And so I'm starting to realize and rack all those times up and realize, you know what, what am I doing? And I think a lot of us do that in our relationships right now. We just make excuses, okay? We tell ourselves it's not that big of a deal. We remind ourselves and we tell ourselves, you know what, we can get through this, you know? We can get through this, we can get through anything, some of it's our ego too. We can we can we can roll past this. We can move forward with this. Or they'll change. They're gonna change. They're gonna wake up. They're gonna change. And so I was talking about passive aggression. Passive aggressive behavior is definitely a technique used, and it's used by people that are often, well, adding to the toxicity in a relationship. It's used as a technique because the inability to communicate, maybe there's a fear factor, maybe there's a disrespect factor. Passive aggressive is usually a learned response. It's something that's been learned, um, whether they felt like they were trapped in a relationship before, couldn't speak their truth. Maybe their mom or dad used passive aggressive behavior and that also transcended into their life. And that's the way that they tried to create power. 
get power, power in the relationship, become the powerful one, okay? Causing the other person to feel insecure, violated, upset, you know, it's nothing like, you know, having that evil glance or, you know, something falls on the floor or while you're trying to have a important conversation with your boss they're in the background slamming every pot and pan in the kitchen because they don't want to be cooking but they don't want to tell you they don't want to cook they just want to make your life a living hell okay another attribute symptom sign of a toxic relationship is is blame is often blame you know one person's often and both people can both participate in this is blaming one another okay excessive blame if it, you know, if, if, if I wouldn't have done this, this wouldn't have happened to me if you wouldn't have done X, Y, Z. This is all your fault. If it wasn't for this, this is all your fault. It's not taking responsibility. So there's a blame situation and the inability to take responsibility, which goes hand in hand to cause toxicity. Okay, that's a big deal. We've got to take responsibility. When we're not taking responsibility, when somebody does not take responsibility for their life, that is a problem, okay? Every person out there, when you hit a certain age, has got to step up to the plate and say, you know what, I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for taking care of myself. I'm responsible for understanding what makes me tick. I'm responsible for doing what I need to do to have a healthy and happy life. I'm responsible for my own happiness, I'm, re I'm responsible for my own self-knowledge. I'm responsible of getting my own self out of the rain. Do you see what I'm saying? And what I found by being a therapist and by being a life coach and by seeing clients day after day is that many people are in relationships with one person that does not want to take responsibility for their issues. Okay. Yes, their poop does stink, and you've got to say that it's yours. And that's been the big problem. And what I found is that when people don't take responsibility, everything else falls by the wayside because you have to finally take responsibility to actually make changes. You've got to actually step up to the plate and say, I am responsible for this. I will do what needs to be done. Because what happens when we don't take responsibility for that? Nothing gets done, one. Two, when we don't take responsibility, well, we can easily use the blame game. We can blame other people for our problems, okay? And we can believe that they are the ones that contribute to our life problems, and they're the reason for not doing this, and they're the reason why I can't get this done, and they're the reason why this didn't happen for me, and they're the reason, and they're the reason, and they're the reason, and they're the reason. It is never my fault. And any of you that are listening to this show right now and you say, my gosh... You must be looking into my household right now. I can help. Because I understand there are ways of getting other people to take responsibilities for their own actions. There's ways for them to see it. There's techniques you can use. And sometimes you can use all the techniques in the world and you can do everything and they're just not willing. And at that point, you have to take responsibility to decide what you're going to deal with. To decide what you're going to deal with. How much more pain and suffering are you going to deal with? Interesting, right? And then you have to take responsibility because when you don't, what does that mean? Ding, 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 ding. We have codependency for for 500. Yeah, so that's what happens. When we don't take responsibility for our own life and we let somebody else not take responsibility. So get this. You've taken responsibility, but you entered a relationship with somebody that doesn't take responsibility. They blame you for everything. And when you finally realize that there's nothing you can do to wake that person up because they're not going to take responsibility, you've tried everything, you're exhausted, you've done everything, you've been a, you know, the poster child of responsibility, then you have to take responsibility and decide how you're going to deal with this. And if you're like, well, I'm just going to see what happens, that's codependency. That's not taking responsibility for the validity of the situation that it's probably not going to get any better. And I'm not saying, oh, I'm not advocating divorce. I'm, this isn't like the Divorce 101 show. But what I'm saying is like, there comes a time when you got to ask yourself, do I want to be sidled with this for the rest of my life? Is this what I want to deal with? Do I want to deal with this every day, day in and day out? I mean, I, I, I hate to say it, but I don't. Actually, you know what? I approve this message. I don't want to be sidled with that. I don't want to. Life is not long enough. 
Okay, I don't have like thousands of years in this lifetime to just screw it off. I mean, there comes a time when you got to look at yourself and say, hey, what am I willing to deal with in this life? And what is the stuff, what is, what is the stuff that I can cut out of my life that I do not need that takes away from my, my happiness? It, it puts me in a funk. It makes me not effective. Okay, because, and this is, is more men than women on this deal. A lot of you men out there think you can compartmentalize your toxic relationship. I mean, you know, it's it's a great theory. I love it. It's a great, great, great theory. It's a great theory on paper. It sounds good. It's sexy looking. It's not true. Okay, it's just not true. And especially for men, I was recently on the news a few days ago talking about this and, and talking about, you know, uh, marriages and how this all works. And it's a very interesting thing because men internalize uh, problems in their marriage more than women do, okay? And, and there's a scientific study done, and I just did a show on this, and it was very interesting. And so men really internalize that because they see themselves as not being able to um, to to change the marriage, to help the marriage. They, they feel ineffective, and being ineffective, they feel, they feel like they're being held down. They feel powerless, and that's definitely nothing that anybody wants to feel, and obviously more so... Um, in, in the male dynamic, I believe is true. When I return, I'm going to be talking more about criticism, uh, and communication as well as that negative energy that really is an integral part of a toxic relationship, but better yet later on what you can do about it. Because I think a lot of times we, we, we hear, we hear people talking about the problems we hear people talking about how awful something is, but rarely do we hear solutions. And I think solutions are very powerful, especially when we're talking about something that has probably taken up a lot of our mind share, has gotten in the way of us making some choices, and has probably really sidetracked us in more of a negative, uh, unfulfilled way. Our friends Elizabeth and Bill Cooper, Precious Paws supplement creators and dog lovers, are in studio today to offer their expert advice on things that we can do to help our dog to be healthy and happy. Elizabeth, great to have you in studio. Hey, Ashley, it's great to be back. You know, as of last week, I was talking to you all about the 15 reasons to adopt a dog instead of buy one. I didn't get to finish my list, so the ninth reason is by adopting, you open up a spot for another deserving dog. And the tenth reason is adopting an adult dog means you can actually look at the size. You can figure out the energy level and the coat traits are already known. Eleven, a dog can ease loneliness and depression. The twelfth thing is shelters want the right home for the dog and they're not a profit motive. Thirteen, adopting a dog is a great lesson in companionship. The fourteenth reason is adopting from a shelter reduces the number of euthanasia. And the last reason to adopt a dog is a dog can reduce anxiety. It also will reduce blood pressure. For more of these dog tips, please go to our website at preciouspawshealth.com. Or follow us on Facebook. I love it when a Bill and Elizabeth come into the studio because it's always some valuable information that we can take with us in our day-to-day -day life. You know, having a dog is so rewarding. Having a cat is so rewarding. And adopting a dog or a cat that wouldn't have a home otherwise makes you feel really good as well. And it's awesome when you're able to have that joy in your household. What I found is that pets are so valuable as far as unconditional love and really connecting the family. And it just allows us to really, I don't know, just really experience another life that's not a human life in our household. Buddy is amazing, and he's just such a, a vibrant amazing soul that's really like a perpetual two-year-old right that's what many of our dogs are that perpetual two-year-old that brings a smile to our face daily great valuable information from elizabeth and bill for more information go to preciouspawshealth.com 
PreciousPawsHealth.com, and there's a valuable wealth of knowledge there about everything from adopting a dog to the use of turmeric to helping senior dogs be able to be or feel like they're a puppy again. Stay tuned when I return to me talking more about toxic relationships and what you can do to work with that toxic relationship and perhaps be able to turn it around. Live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess. will be back in. I'll be back this time in two shakes. This is Jake Busey, and you're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On tonight's show, I'm talking about toxic relationships and what you can do about it once you've figured out that you have a toxic relationship. You know, oftentimes, because it's so normal, we've been around it so long, and it's not like you have a bunch of people, like a like a studio audience listening to you saying, oh, oh that was bad. Mm, gosh, that comment was rude. No, it's just you're, you got your two ears, and you're trying to figure it out, and you don't know, and you just kind of go, well, I guess everybody else deals with this. Seems about normal. You know, like me talking about my car. I felt like everybody went to the shop like 70 times in the, in the life of a car. I mean, come on. <laughs> I guess if they've had it for 70 years. But, I mean, apparently, apparently what I've been through is not normal. Okay? But I made it, I made it okay because I didn't want to deal with it. You know, I didn't want to change things. I, I was... And I feel the same way. Like, right now, I'm just now getting to the point where I realize... This relationship is probably not the best relationship. Like, I'm starting to realize that. Much like when we realize the toxic relationships in our life. And that's what I want to talk more about. Is right before the break, I've been talking about blame game and that situation is when we blame others because we're not taking responsibility for our own situation. And, and then the whole issue of, you know, being in a relationship with someone that's not going to take responsibility. I mean, that's really hard, okay? Just FYI, everybody's got to take responsibility. Okay, and they don't have to. Okay, let it be known. There are folks that I I think are great, but they do not take responsibility for anything. And I keep them at arm's length because every time I'm around them, something bad happens. Okay, and are they going to take responsibility? Heck no. Heck no. They don't take responsibility for anything. And the last thing I want to be involved in is a relationship with someone that doesn't take responsibility for their actions. Okay, and for their life. And that's one of the most critical things is that it kind of goes back to all the toxicity. When one person puts and blames another person for everything they do and they don't take responsibility for their actions in their life, it causes a problem. It causes like a jump, a missing link in the system. Because what happens is, is that that person that's not taking responsibility, um, like, puts all their energy and power and resentment and criticism on the other person because the other person's got to be perfect in every way, okay? Because they're ba- the other person's basically holding everybody up, okay? And so instead of saying, you know what, I need to work on myself, they find all the little nitpicky things they can nitpick about the other person. You see what I'm saying? Putting them down, making criticism, critiques, and the criticism is one of the most interesting things I find is because when you're in a toxic relationship, what happens is you're being criticized a lot and oftentimes you don't even realize it because you hurt it so much. And I always find that interesting when I'm in, um, you know, I'm I'm hanging out with people and they're married and you hang out with a different couple. And and I'm definitely not psychoanalyzing all my friends, okay? Let's let's get that. I have to work enough... You know, during the week and the weekend, I'm, I'm not doing that when I'm going out. But but you catch certain things when people make comments to one another and they're kind of rude and they're derogatory and you can tell that the person has heard this before. It's a very interesting dynamic. And I, I feel that criticism is a way of channeling anger. Okay, it's almost like that passive aggressive thing. I'm going to criticize you. I'm going to devalue you. I'm going to I'm going to find how you're going to feel worthless. I'm going to devalue you. And if we're having an argument and I might be the one to blame, I'm going to find something wrong with you, something you've done. A good example of this 
when it comes to perhaps a family member, like a parent or somebody like that, um, when when somebody's doing well in their life, when things have been, when they've worked really hard, but they've gotten to a good spot in their life, and the family member or the parent looks at them and and and, and brings up something that happened at one of the lowest parts and lowest points of that person's life. Okay, so things are going well for this person. Life is good. They've been making some amazing strides. They've gotten to a place that's good. But somehow or not, it has affected the parent or the family member or the friend in a way that they have to lash out and make a comment and criticize and criticize in a way that brings up the past, right? Brings up the past and something stupid or dumb um, or horrible or whatever that that person did in the past, okay? So, um, you know, I recently had a client who graduated uh, graduate school and was really, really happy. And, you know, they were older when they graduated, and I totally respect that because I think it's never too late to go back to school, Um and they, they graduate, they're really happy, and they, they got a great job, and they're really happy about that. And they were visiting their family. Uh, they had a few days. They flew up to see their mom and dad and, and some other people. And when they were up there, one of their relatives made a comment and said, you know, oh, this is great. And they were all happy. And they go, but remember when you did X, Y, Z? And they had uh, a long time ago, probably 15 years ago, had been arrested for uh, a marijuana charge. And, you know, it. they, they, they got a lawyer. They, they ended up, you know, it wasn't a big deal. But, you know, it was big enough that they had to get legal representation. And it kind of, it kind of, um, it was kind, it was kind of like the precursor of some problems happening in their life. And so this person literally has got all these great things happen. And the person takes them and cuts them down to size with that criticism. And that criticism is two-pronged, right? The first way is I'm going to cut you down to size. But the other reason why I'm criticizing you is because I'm angry at you. I must be resentful at you. Or I'm feeling insecure right now about where you are now in your life. And so I'm going to cut you down to size so that your britches aren't that big. And it happens a lot of times in marriages, too, um, that consistent criticism and that, that kind of that negative energy and and I find that sometimes also there's a, there's a lot of arguing without communication, um, yelling at one another, and, and things aren't being solved. It just seems that the anger and the fight carries over to the next day, carries over to the next day, carries over to the next day. And it's also interesting in really toxic relationships where um, the spouse, and in a toxic marriage where the spouse will... Um, want to actually have sex even in the middle of an argument, a fight. Even in the same pattern of literally, you know, an hour to two hours before talking about how they want to get a divorce and you're not worth this and I can't stand you and I want out of this relationship. And in an hour later, like hugging and caressing, trying to have sexual relations with this person. And then if the person gives in to them, what happens? The same fight continues later on down the road. The next morning, nothing's changed. You would think normally that, you know, you would think normally in, in a normal, sorry, in a healthy relationship, you, you, don't have, you don't have sex when you're angry, right? You see what I'm saying? That's in a, that's in a, that's in a healthy relationship. Because when you're having sex when you're angry and you're continuing that anger all the way through... What is that? What is that then? And what is the use of it? So is that a power play? Is that is that a power struggle? And and I don't know about you, but when you when I'm working with folks about this kind of stuff, and I don't know if you're involved with something like this, because anybody that is, and if you know somebody that a friend of yours has you know confided in you, what happens is that when they get really close to that other person, you know, romantically, even though there's this huge argument looming. One person's always going to think that things are going to get better, but what happens is it gets even worse, and so their emotions are on their sleeve. They're feeling as though they're in this blender. They they don't know what's happening. They're they're discombobulated because they they just had an emotional connection with this person and a physical connection with this person, but yet the anger and the resentment's still there. You see what I'm saying? And I still want a divorce. So it's a very interesting thing. And and one of the caveats, too, is that, you know, in a toxic relationship, 
people like to hold things over people's head. Um, a, a good example of a toxic um, mother and father relationship with a child is, uh, and, and I'm not meaning like a child, it could be a child, you know, up to the age of six, 60, but I mean, so their child, they're upset, they're angry with one of their offsprings, and the only thing they have to hold over that offspring's head is the will. Well, we're going to cut you out. You continue to do that, you're cut out. You do that again, you're cut out of the will. If you marry that person, you're done, you're out of the will. If you can test the will, you're out of the will. Because that's the one thing they can hold over that person's head. Another example of that is a married couple where the other person's constantly asking for the divorce. And they, they do it any time that the other person, any time the spouse asks them a question or, you know, is questioning their whereabouts or where they were. You know, hey, you know, a good example is, you know, a couple that's married, uh, you know, the... The, the wife or the husband is, is going out all the time, getting back late, late, late at night, three in the morning, two in the morning. I mean, when you're married, that's really not acceptable, by the way. It's really not. Okay. I mean, constantly, that's not. I mean, you do it once, you know, once every six months or whatever, and you're going out with your friends or whatever. That's one thing. But when you're doing this all the time, this is a red flag. And the, and the spouse asks, hey, what, what's going on? What are you doing? You know, what's happening? And right then the other person's like, I want a divorce. I'm out of here. I can't stand this. So that's their way of manipulating, manipulating the situation and using their tr- using their card, using their trump card, which is the same as as the uh, the money in the will with the parent and the kid. And it works. It works very well because it scares the other person into stepping back into line. Because the other person doesn't want the divorce and they know that. The spouse knows that the other person doesn't want the divorce. That's why they're using it. It's the trump card. It's the one card. It's the card. It's a card. It's the ring to rule all rings. It's the ring to rule humanity. You know that on the Lord of the Rings. It's the ring to rule men, whatever it was. Yeah, it's the same thing. And that's what a toxic relationship is, is when somebody breaks it down and uses that as a power play and consistently using that over and over again to get their way to keep the other person in line, that's toxic. When I return, I'm going to be offering some suggestions on how to deal with your toxic relationship once you've been able to figure out that you're in one. Stay tuned. Live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess. will be back in. I'll be back this time in two shakes. You could be my luck. Get in here. You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's show, I've been talking about toxic relationships. How to identify that one toxic relationship or several toxic relationships in your life. You know, now is the time for solution. We figured out that we're in a toxic relationship. We realized that we're dealing with a lot of issues. We have realized that we thought this was normal. Not healthy, though. And now we're understanding that this has affected our life. It's caused chaos. It's caused a little bit of resentment, some unhappiness. Now what do we do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay, so let's begin with what we do once we realize this is toxic. How do we make some changes in this relationship? Okay, we can't always fix every relationship, but I believe that if it's worth it to us, we need to try. Okay, it's worth the try. Because you don't ever want to look back at a situation with a lot of regret. You don't ever want to look back and say, man, if I would have just done that, everything would have been better. You want to be able to look at the situation and say, I've done everything, or look, wow, things are changing, things are moving in the right direction, and I feel good about it. The first thing you want to do is you want to create some sort of ground rules in your relationship. And these ground rules, I think, is somewhat like what we talk about, boundaries. Okay, there's certain things that will and won't happen. There's certain ground rules. And when you're setting those ground rules, you're basically telling somebody and you're informing them how you want to be treated. Okay? We teach people and we train people how we want to be treated. When we allow people to do things against the way that we feel, when we allow people to break boundaries, when we don't create any boundaries because we're so codependent, we basically allow willy-nilly, we allow things to just be liaise-faire, however they are, and what happens oftentimes is that we're unhappy and things don't seem to be working out to the way they need to be, the way they need to be going. And so when we're setting these ground rules, you know, it's about just normal stuff, about work, 
about life, about things that you'll accept and things you won't. Hey, when I'm at work and I work and I, I'm, I have to be there from 8 to 7 p.m., I cannot be on my cell phone all the time. You, you can't be calling me 25 times a day or leaving 50 text messages. There's got to be a limitation. And, and there's a lot of things that have to go into this, especially with the setting of the boundaries that goes directly with the groundwork, is that you can set the groundwork, but then you got to implement it and put it into action. Okay, you got to implement it and put it into action, because if you don't, it's basically like what you're saying doesn't really matter. Okay, it it really shows the other person that, you know what, you're not going to stand up to it. You're going to say it, but then you're going to cave. You're going to cave like you've always caved. Okay, and that does not work because that trains the other person that if I go with this for a week and deal with it, I can break down their boundaries. I can break down this stuff and I'm going to get the power again. And so a lot of times in life, we got to get out of our normal routine, that codependent routine. We got to be able to see that first. And we got to set personal groundwork and personal ground rules with ourselves and say, you know what? I understand that I'm a people pleaser. I understand that I was raised that way, but I am going to identify this codependency and I'm not going to allow my codependency, people pleasing attitude to get in the way of me being treated fairly. Because oftentimes when we are codependent, we allow ourselves in these unhealthy relationships because we're scared. What happens if we're not in this relationship? We'll be alone. Nobody else is going to love us. This is the only relationship we're ever going to have. We're never going to find somebody this good, okay? But the problem is not only that. The problem is that we haven't even done our work on ourselves. We're so scared of losing the other person. We've already lost ourselves. Yes, and that's so valuable. I'm going to have to write that down. That's an amazing quote that I just came up with because we are too scared. We're too scared to lose the other person that we've already lost ourselves. Think about it. So we're stuck. We're stuck in a relationship where we're too scared to speak up, too scared to say how we feel, too scared to call out someone else's passive-aggressive attitude or negative attitude or them not taking responsibility because we're scared because we don't want to lose them even though we are in a relationship that is doomed for the most part unless we speak up. We're caught, we're, we're creating our own toxic reality by going along with the status quo. Okay? If we're not honest and truthful about how we feel, nothing is going to change. It's always going to be the same because there's no reason for things to change until we actually need it to change and we speak it into its existence. And so by creating the groundwork and the rules for an efficient, positive, toxic-free relationship, By actually saying, hey, I will accept this and hey, I won't accept that. And then creating those boundaries that when somebody goes against what you said in the ground rules and the groundwork for the for the relationship, you say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that because this is this is something I won't do. You see what I'm saying? Boundaries is standing up for what you believe in. And. Once you get over dealing with the codependency and the fear of losing the other person and realizing that you're valuable, that's when you don't care about the other stuff and you go, no, 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 no. You need to respect my boundaries because this is important to me. You know, another thing that you want to do is you need to begin to really make time for yourself. You need to make time for yourself and spend some time with yourself to recognize who you are, what you stand for, and also to start cutting some of those codependent ties. Because even if the relationship works out and everything works out, you're still codependent. You've got to deal with that because and in order to get over that, you've got to find yourself because right now, until you identify who you are and find that love and respect about you, you're just there on your own freaking out because you can't stand it because you're on your own. And that's one thing that it took me about a year of my life to understand. I, I long time ago, I got out of a relationship and I took a year off from everything. I mean, I worked and everything, but I took a year off to get to know myself. And it was one of the most profound, it was the most profound experience I've ever had because it created a relationship with myself 
that I cared about myself and I love myself in a way that I wasn't going to allow myself to be in another toxic relationship, except for obviously my car and I. But as far as that's concerned, I really worked and realized what I would deal with, what I'm not going to deal with, and I knew exactly what I stand for. Toxic relationships don't help us to do anything. We've got to get to the bottom of it. We've got to try to change the situation. And if the situation cannot be changed, we have to be willing and able and powerful enough to move on. By the way, if you're looking for some valuable video content, go to YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, by the way. I know, it's pretty cool. Go to YouTube and search Ashley Burgess, B-E-R-G-E-S, easy breezy. I put up new videos every single week discussing toxic relationships, overcoming marital issues, and the list goes on. So if you're looking for some valuable content, definitely check out my YouTube channel as well as check out the website. There's a lot of additions every week at AshleyBurgess.com. In the meantime, it's been a great show. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to live your true life. Live Your True Life Perspectives will be back this time in three shakes.